morning. All right. So this is a continuation of my Tuesday's lecture. There was nobody there. Not a single soul was in the exam. Fortunately, my, my I don't know, faithful, loyal graduate student. He's not my graduate student. He's a graduate student. I don't own him, but he came. <laughs> he is not a solid mechanician. He is a expertise. He's in fluid mechanics, but he wants to learn finite element. So uh, it's just good to talk to somebody, you know. <laughs> uh, I had to speak to the operator, which is okay. Um, yeah, I can't blame anyone, but it'll be nice, you know, if you stop by uh, and there's a makeup lecture, you know. You don't have to watch it, you know. You say, now you have to go and watch, and you didn't watch. You didn't have the discipline to watch. If you had come, that's done. 50 minutes, you are done. You know, you can just sit there, daydream, and over. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> think about lunch. And okay, anyway, so to your benefit, there's no point in continuing because you are going to be left out. So I'll just briefly tell, you want to tell them what you learned? No. Oh, he, here is one. He didn't come, but at least he watched the tape. Uh, so that's good. Uh, that, that at least you should have watched the same day. You know, I, I can't understand you, you couldn't come, but you, you should have watched it because it's very important because we have to have the continuity. <clears throat> See, I, I lose sleep when I, when I miss classes, you know. Uh, do, you, do you lose sleep when you miss class? She <laughs> Okay, so the problem, we started with the, the plain truss or 2D truss, okay. So what, what, you all know what truss is, I'm not going to repeat it. You learned in so many classes. So the, your truss is, I uh, can't believe it. Yeah, a structure that is composed of several uniaxial bar elements. A truss, the member takes only tension or compression. The beauty is it cannot bend, it just, or twist, it just extends or compresses. There's only two forces it can take. So plane truss means all the members are in one plane and the forces are also in the one plane. It's so a 2D truss. So the 2D truss looks like this. And, and uh, so I was telling each, if you draw the free body diagram of uh, any typical member, it has the first node, I call it I, today I'll call it first node, and second node. Okay, each truss element has a first node and second node. We can choose either one as the first node or second node, but the angle, it defines changes. So if we choose this as the first node, this is as the second node, as I've shown, then this is the angle. The angle is measured from the x-axis counterclockwise. So it will be approximately, let's say, 60 degrees. For well, somebody chooses two as the first node and one as the second node, which is legitimate. Or two as the first node, this as the first node, and this as the second node. Their angle will be measured like that. Start from the x-axis, and then you have to counterclockwise come this. So this is probably 300 degrees, you can say. That is fine. So it won't be 300. It will be, uh, how much it will be? Two, <coughs> 270 minus 30, 240. Or you can say uh, minus 120. So this is, a, it's a, it's a, so the angle changes which one you choose, the first node or second node, okay? <coughs> So, what, so yet, yet a typical truss element has four degrees of freedom. What are the four degrees of freedom? So let's, let's call this first node, second node. Now first node has U1. It can go in the horizontal direction. It can go in the vertical direction. So U1 and V1. This node can go in the horizontal direction, U2. It can go in the vertical direction. So it has four degrees of freedom. Two node, so this element it's called a two-node, four degree of freedom element, four DOF element. Okay. Now, <clears throat> corresponding to each displacement, there will be a force. That forces are shown like this, Fx1, Fy1, Fx2, sorry, F, yeah, Fx2, Fy2. 
Now, if this is element E, it can be some number, you have to show, it's very important, you show these forces belong to element E because there will be another little fx1 somewhere that belongs to another element. Okay, so this. Now, in finite element, always, our goal is to derive a stiffness matrix that connects, relates this, these four forces, fx1, fi1, fx2, fi2, these are the four forces acting on the element that has to be connected to these four corresponding degrees of freedom, u1, v1, u2, v2. So I'm not going to go through the derivation that is in the tape. Finally, we derived, the stiff, this is called the element stiffness matrix. Element stiffness matrix of the element is given by there's a common factor A, E over L. What is A? Area of cross-section of the truss member. The L is the length of the member. E is the Young's modulus of the member. So it is a proper stiffness of the uh, element. It's, and then here you have, um, we define L equal to cosine phi and M equal to sine phi where phi is the angle the element makes with the x-axis. So this matrix is L square, L, M, L, M, M square. And in this quadrant, everything will be negative, minus L square, minus L, M, minus L, M, minus M square. This is a symmetric matrix. All the stiffness matrices are symmetric. And then finally, okay, so, and then whenever you write a stiffness matrix, you have to have the row addresses and column addresses. Otherwise, it's useless. So the address here is U1, V1, U2, V2. This is the row address. If you want, you can write the column address also. Now, I have seen books where they, the, the stiffness matrix will look different. The reason is the way they order the degrees of freedom will be U1, U2, v1, v2. If you do that, this will all be jumbled up. So that's why this row address and column address are very important because it, depending on how you order the degrees of freedom, the stiffness matrix will look uh, uh, different. Okay. So this is the element stiffness matrix. For, you can do this for each element. Now what we do is to solve the problem. In a truss, in a truss at each node you can apply two forces. At each node you can apply an x force Y4. These are external forces. Now you hang on the truss. Huh? Um, Fx2, Fy2, these are the external forces, uppercase forces, Fxn, Fyn. Suppose there are n nodes in the truss. You can apply so many forces. They are related to your global or structural stiffness matrix times all the degrees of freedom, U1, V1, U2, etc., etc., Vn. How do you get this global or structural stiffness matrix? By assembling the little element stiffness matrices. Once you assemble, we usually call it structural stiffness matrix Ks. Then we delete the rows and columns corresponding to zero degrees of freedom. I'll show an example. And finally, we end up with a nice equation for F equals Kq, where K is the global stiffness matrix. Qs are the, all the unknown degrees of freedom. F is the, all the known forces. Once you solve, you know the displacements, Q. Once you find Q, we have to find the element forces and the reactions. I will show in the worked example. Okay. The example I chose is a three-bar three bar truss. It's a statically indeterminate truss because if you want to hang something, you need only, I told you on Tuesday, you need only two members. Suppose you want to hang a bike or something in your garage, you need only two members. To in the ceiling, you can and there, there is a force F is applied. But I have to strengthen it to make it strong. I have what is called a redundant member, which is not needed, but I have it. So this is the problem I want to solve. What is the goal? How much I, the node will displace? I want to know, and also what are the forces on each member so that I can design by the proper angle or rod from the Home Depot. And then also I need to know the reactions so that I can have proper uh, screws or bolts or whatever in the ceiling so that they don't fall apart. So this is 
uh, if you want to solve a finite element, already there is a finite element. You don't have to discretize or you don't have to model it. So basically these are the nodes. I call them one, two, three, four. There are four nodes. What are nodes? Nodes are where elements talk to each other or elements are supported in the, uh, to, the, to the support. And there are three elements. So let's go to the board from here. So if you, I'll stand here and <coughs> so you can watch, see me or you can watch the okay. So this is the thing. So first for each element, are you able to see or you want me to enlarge? Good? Yeah. So for each element, there are three elements, you have to choose the first node and second node. It's arbitrary. So here for node element one, I chose one as the first node, four as the second node. For element two, I chose four as the first node, two as the second node, and four and three. And that decides the angle phi for E. For element one, it is a negative 60 degrees. You can, you can see, I, I didn't give the angle. The angle has to be 30 degrees each. I, I, should, have, I should have told you. This is 30. Okay. So angle element two, you can see 90 degrees, a vertical upright, and element three is plus 60 degrees. Okay. So I chose the angle that easy calculation. You want some, Oliver? Any question to me? No. Oh, yeah. What was, what was phi in? Oh, phi is the angle that an element makes with the x-axis. Phi is the angle an element makes with the x-axis. Didn't I tell you? I told, yeah. So we, we chose the phi. We have to know how to choose phi, not how to choose, how to calculate phi by looking at, but you, by now you should know. The, for each element, there is an AU over L. It's the stiffness of the element. In this problem, all members have same area of cross-section, Young's model the same length. So all have the same axial stiffness, AU over L. Then I calculate the direction cosine L and M, cosine phi, sine phi, okay. Then I go to each uh, stiffness matrix. I look at the formula I wrote here. I just substitute. I took the four outside of convenience. Otherwise, this four will be in the denominator everywhere. It's too many fours, so I took the four outside the matrix, so be careful. And then you have to write the row address and column address. How do you, I know the first node and second node. Once you choose, are you able to see the hand there? Yeah. So if you choose the node 1 and 4, first node and second node, then the row addresses are u1, v1, u4, v4. You cannot change that. If you look at the second element, it is 4 and 2. First node is 4, second node is 2. So if you look at the row addresses of second element, u4, v4, u2, v2. Same thing with the third element, u4, v4, u3, v3. And be careful with the 4 here in the outside. Okay. So I have all the, now I have to assemble. Assembling is like I told you, like this male an example. This is the global stiffness matrix. There are four nodes, so there will be eight uh, degrees of freedom in this problem. So there will be eight by eight structural stiffness matrix. There are eight forces you can see. At each node, there are two forces, Fx1, Fy1, etc. And there are eight displacement or eight degrees of freedom for the problem. How do you assemble them? You go to each. Um, member and see what row and what column are there and then put it there. Very painful. I heard it's very strenuous. But once you get used to it, you do it bulk, you know. In the beginning you put one by one. Then once you get the hang of it, you are able to take the entire cluster and then put, you know, you get the pattern. So you, you have to, pra I can't teach this, you have to learn, okay, you have to do it. That's why you do homework problems. So now I have this big structural stiffness matrix. I, a lot of rows and columns are deleted because in this problem, there are six degrees of freedom are zero. U1, V1, U2, V2, U3, V3. So I'm going to delete all the first six rows and first six columns, they're all gone. So what is left is the, the lowest corner here. You'll see this big, small corner, U4, V4. And then I need two forces, Fx4, Fy4. At the node 4, I can apply two forces, one in the x direction, one in the y direction. I chose not to apply any force in the x direction, so force is zero. In the y direction, I applied a vertical force in the downward direction. I call it negative F. It's a downward force, negative F. So I solve this problem. I get U. This is a symmetric truss. So what happens? You see this? Since it's symmetric truss, 
Since I didn't apply any horizontal force, there is no horizontal displacement. U4 is zero, and there is only vertical displacement negative, which means it, the node comes down, no surprise. 0.4, round number, 0.4 FL over AE. Okay. Now we have to find the elongation of each element so that we can find the forces in each element. So without, um, so if you have an element, node I, node J, I is the first node, J is the second, or if I would call it one and two, people, some people don't know which comes first, I comes first or J comes first. Now you forgot the alphabets, so it's easy to, it's just true. If you don't use it for a long, if you don't sing the alphabet soup song, you forget. So. So this is first node, this is second node. What you have solved, after you solve the finite element problem, I know U1, I know V1, I know U2, I know V2. Because I know either they are zero or I have solved it, everything is known. I need to find delta L of the element, okay? The delta L, this is the formula, the, it is, there is another coordinate system I define in the tape, if you go back and look at it, it's called X bar, Y bar coordinate system. The X bar coordinate system is along the length of the element, Y bar is perpendicular. And the same degrees of freedom, U1 and V1, can be resolved as U1 bar, V1 bar. Instead of resolving the displacement like this, we can resolve them U1 bar, V1, V1 bar, and then U2 bar, U2 bar, V2 bar. Any vector can be resolved in any coordinate system you want. So you can resolve them in the U1, V1, or U1 bar, V1 bar, same thing. Delta L is basically U2 bar minus U1 bar. This point, it, 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 it depends on how the displacement along the length of the bar. So U2 bar minus U1 bar is the length of elongation. But we don't know U2 bar, U1 bar. We know only U1, V1, finite element solves all the displacements and the global degree of freedom. Take it from me, this is U2 bar is L U2 plus M V2 minus L U1 plus M V1. Need to write this down. And this is also in the book. This can be written as L U2 minus U1 plus M V2 minus V1. So this is the formula for delta M. So delta L of any element, if you know the, the four displacements, U1, V1, U2, V2 of the two nodes, if you know the direction cosines, then this formula tells you the elongation of the element, delta L. Then once you find delta, that's what I did. I, I, I find the delta L here, if you look at the formula, I did the delta L by using this, this formula, substituting the answers, I found delta L. Uh, once you find delta L, P is easy. P is simply given by A U over L, the axial stiffness of the member times delta L. A U over L like a spring, can you see? Yeah. A U over L is like a spring stiffness, delta L is the elongation, so P is the axial force. So if you look at the work example, <coughs> I have calculated delta L1, P1. Delta L2 is U2 bar minus U4 bar. You have to know which is the second node, which is the first node. Then you substitute in terms of U2, uh, L and M, U2, V2, etc. I calculated P2 and P3. The, the beautiful thing is I check for equilibrium. Look at this. All the members are in tension, I think, in this problem. So I'm applying a force F. Oh, follow me carefully. I'm applying a force F. I found all the member forces. All are in tension in this problem. You see, the tension means it's pulling the joint, okay? What, what we, see, the, you do this in statics. A lot of people don't understand what I'm doing this. They say, tension is shown like this. Do you remember that, those days? Looks like compression. Do you remember this? The, Dr. Jenkins said tension, or Dr. Dickerel said tension should be shown like that. You always said it is look like a compression. This is, this force is not acting on the member. This is forty force acting on the free body diagram of the joint. So if you look at this joint, external force F, 
this is under tension, so it's pulling it. This is under tension, it's pulling it, it's pulling it. So the, for, the, the arrow we show, long, 200 years ago we agreed, it is the force acting on the joint. So it looks like this member is under compression. No, it is not. It is, this is being pulled out of the ceiling. That's why this is the force acting on the, on the, on the, on the, on the support. Anyway, I have shown equilibrium is satisfied. Some of the X forces are zero because symmetric. We can see some of the X forces are zero. And then I did the, some of the Y forces. Uh, minus F is coming down. Two-fifth of F is going up. Then there are components of the two inclined force. I'm very happy. They all balance the world. Everything is going very well in this world. Uh, I, that's, I don't know. I'm not sure about it, but it looks like everything is fine. Now, I, how to find the reactions? To find the reactions, you have to go back to this formula, this matrix, structural stiffness matrix. I want to find Fx3. So and in this example, I just want to find Fx3 and Fy3. So if you look at the Fx3, you have to go th take this row, follow my hand there, the palm, this row, multiply by this column. Fortunately, a lot of zeros here, all the degrees of freedom are zero. Similarly, Fy3. So I did that for you, Fx3. Um, Fx3 is, I, I took the, the multiply the two matrices, I got Fx3 and Fy3, some weird number, okay? Then I said, let me go check whether it makes sense. So I looked at node three, I looked at node three, I put the Fx3, I put the Fy3, I found the, I found the uh, Pythagorean resultant, I got square root of three over five F, and lo and behold, that member is under tension of square root of three over five F. That means basically these two reactions are balancing the tension in this member. So everything looks checks. So it's beautiful. It's a statically indeterminate problem. I don't know if they taught you how to do it. It's very difficult. I'm sure they taught you in Sweden how to do it. No, uh, it's. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not, you have, no, it's very difficult. You have to remove the redundant member first, solve the problem, and see what kind of force in the redundant member will match. See, the idea here is, you remove the redundant member and then solve the problem, which is very straightforward. Everybody can do it. When you do it, what happens, you get that it comes like this. But it's, it's not supposed to come like this. So you have, when add a redundant member, it's going to pull it back. Okay, so we, what kind of force you need in this member to pull it back? So it's a very complicated thing, okay? If I, if to take another class, I don't want to waste your money by teaching statics. But look at finite element, doesn't matter. It's just, it's a routine thing. Uh, just look at, uh, computer loves such things, mindless things, you know? You just take the element stiffness matrix, assemble it, delete the rows and columns, solve. Once you, for one element, once you do that, it just goes in the loop and keeps doing the same thing. I used to teach how to write a finite element code in the class, and students wrote in Fortran, 1986 to 1995. It's, you want to do it, it's a lot of fun, writing a finite element code, okay? It, it, you won't believe it. The, the, the finite element codes are only this, this, this long. This, this is not very big. Um, anyway, any question on this? This is the only example I will do in 2D trust. There may be an additional example in the book. Philip. Clear the steps? Read the book also. The book is, have you, how many of you read the book? You like the book? Like, yeah. We put a lot of effort after, I, I wrote this chapter after teaching for 20 years. So you should dispel all your questions. Uh, you know, people write books without teaching, then uh, you, you get a lot of questions. Okay. So now next, um, 3D truss or space truss. <clears throat> space truss is very important for aerospace, not because it's space. Uh, <laughs> space truss is meaning, uh, you know what I mean. It's a 3D truss. It's nothing to do with uh, atmosphere. Okay, what is that? Chapter... So we need to opening space truss or 3D truss. 
Now, the members are all over. No, it doesn't. But still, the members take only tension or compression. 3D truss are very difficult to make. Very, very difficult. You know why? 2D truss are riveted or bolted. What is the truss, difference between truss and a frame? If this is a truss, all the joints should be riveted or bolted so that they can swivel. They can. If I put, if I put a gusset plate and weld it, it becomes a frame. If it's a frame, even I don't need this member. This is a redundant member. I don't need it. For a frame, that's all I need only. A, I can put a plate here. I can put weld it. You understand? The frame, then it becomes bending. The frame will have a tension. If you take a cross section of a frame, it will have a tension. It will have a shear force. It will have a bending moment. So frames are collection of beams, whereas Trusses are collection of uniaxial bar elements. Now, space truss, very difficult to make. I, I remember 20, 30 years ago, one of my colleagues in the aerospace building built a space truss for a NASA project. Obviously, we have a coordinate system X, Y, Z now. So the members can be all over. All the, Third, third direction, okay? How, how, how are these joints to be? Can anybody tell me? Imagine that the 3D truss, how do you connect the two members? Anyone? You, you cannot look at Google. You can look there. How do you connect two members in a 3D truss? In a 2D truss, I said they are riveted or bolted, so they can they can swivel, okay, or uh, swivel. Yeah, is it like a ball and point? <laughs> Man, you are ahead of time, yeah. It's a ball and socket joint, like your shoulder. So you have to make a ball and socket joint and then connect all the members so that they all kind of nicely work. It's very difficult to make. Imagine you have to have a ball and socket joint for each joint. NASA did it for some project. Frame is easy to make, just weld it, okay. So what is a, so the 3D truss, um, <clears throat> at each node I can apply three forces. I can apply a force in the uh, X direction, I can apply a force in the Y direction, I can force apply a force in the C direction, and Z direction. And each node can move in, suppose this is node one, it can go in the X direction, V1, W1. So it's a, it's a two node, six degree of freedom element. So if you draw the free body diagram of a 3D, 3D truss element, it is, let's say this is the first node, node one, node two, it will have three forces, Fx1, Fy1, Fz, sorry, little f, little f, sorry about it, little f, Fx1, Fy1, Fz1, corresponding displacement U1, V1, W1. Then here you'll have U2, V2, W2, and then corresponding forces, Fx2, Fi2, Fz2. There are six forces acting on the member and there are six degrees of freedom. Now, how do you define the, how do you define the direction? Direction cosines. This, this, direct, this is a vector, so it, it has three direction cosines, L, M, N. These are the direction cosines of the element going from the first node to second node. How do you calculate them? Beautiful, very simple. L is given by x2 minus x1 by length of the element. M is given by y2 minus y1 by length of the element. And then N is given by z2 minus z1 over length. So if once you choose the first and second node, you can choose anything you want. You can call this first node call the second node or the other way. Once you choose the first and second node, mindlessly do this calculation. Find the x-coordinate of the two nodes, x2 minus x1 by L. People who, suppose you are taking the exam, you choose that as the first node, this as the second node, your answer will be different. You will be L equal to x, no, kind of reverse. So you have a negative number in your L. But finally the answer is finally, everybody will get the same answer at the end of the day. M, N, these are the direction cosines. Once you find the direction cosines, 
the element stiffness matrix I'm not going to derive I'll show how it looks <coughs> Okay, so three degrees of freedom per node, U, V, W, there are three forces, Fx, Fy, Fz, and uh, element stiffness matrix will be six by six. There are six forces and six degrees of freedom at each, for each element. Uh, and then, don't worry about the derivation. Uh, this is the element stiffness matrix. K equals AU over L, the stiffness. Look at the inside, L square, LM, now we have additional term L times N, L, N. M square, M, N, then N, N square. Then the whole quadrant, it becomes negative here, this quadrant, and then the symmetric matrix, and then here again you repeat this L square, L, M, L, N. Okay. So this is the six by six element stiffness matrix. What are the row and column addresses? Row addresses are U, I, V, I, W, I for the first node. U, J, V, J, and W, J for the second node. So these are the element stiffness matrix. So that's all you need to know. Now the problem is very simple. You write the element stiffness matrix for each element. Suppose this is the problem <coughs> here. I don't know, can you see it? There are three members attached to the wall and you are trying to hang your bike or something. Now you need to know the coordinates. So here the table, we have the node numbers and all the coordinates are given. Then the next table, you have AU over L, that is the axial stiffness uh, of the member. Then I to J, we have to choose the first node and second node. Uh, we have chosen here one, two, three as the first node and four as the second node for all the elements. Then you find the direction cosines using the formula I gave you, L, um, little l, little m, little n. Once you know the formula, you can write the stiffness matrix for each element very easily. Example, what? That's all. This. Hmm. Okay, so you assemble, you get the global stiffness matrix. Okay, now <coughs> I think I, I have to teach this. This now it's becoming insane. If you want to assemble your structural stiffness matrix, how big the matrix will be, Oliver? There are four nodes. Each node has two degrees of freedom. So eight, so it will be eight by eight matrix. It's, it's becoming out of hand, okay? <clears throat> there is one, one shortcut. You don't assemble the structural stiffness matrix. You assemble directly the element stiffness matrix. It's a global stiffness matrix. How do you do that? You delete the rows and columns in the element stiffness matrix also. See, this is the element stiffness matrix. Suppose in this example, U1, V1, W1 are, uh, the first node are fixed, they are zero. Then I kind of delete the first three rows and three columns here. I assemble only the non-zero degrees of freedom. So instead of assembling the KS, which is the structural stiffness matrix, which is in this example, it will be, it will be a, uh, oh, each node has three degrees of freedom. I for this three-dimensional problem. So four times three, 12. So it will be a 12 by 12 matrix. And there are 12 forces you can apply in the structure, including the reaction. There are 12 degrees of freedom, including the support. Now it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a laborious task. In fact, the way I write the finite element program, I don't assemble KS, okay? We don't assemble the big matrix. I assemble directly. How, what is the size of, in this problem, anyone can tell, can anyone tell me what is the size of K, global stiffness matrix? How many active degrees of freedom are there? How many degrees of freedom are alive? Well, you be, who cares if you make a mistake, you know? Three. Three. There's only one node that is active. 
it has three degrees of freedom. So it is going to be, a, there are only three degrees of freedom uh, that is going to be U4, V4, W4. And then this, this will be a three by three matrix. There are only three forces you can apply, Fx4, Fy4, Fz4. So look at the difference. Assembling a 12 by 12 structural stiffness matrix, deleting nine rows and nine columns is insane. So you can directly assemble the global stiffness matrix. So basically, you, you form this. You look for the element in this. So if you, if you want to assemble this matrix, so you just go and look for only this term, U4, V4, W4. So each element, each element, if the degree of freedom is we're going to be struck here, you strike it there itself, the element stiffness matrix itself, and take only those elements from, deliver them that are active, okay? Yeah, corresponding to U4, V4, W4. Don't worry about other things, okay? Now, <clears throat> th this method works fine. Where, where, it, where the problem is, I'll, I'll show you. So you solve the U4, V4, W4. Then you have to find the length of the elongation of the element is given by <clears throat> L times uj minus ui plus m times vj minus vi plus n times wj minus wi, where i and j are the first and second node respectively, where i and j are the first and second nodes It's very important because depending on what you choose, your first node and second node, this, this will change. But everybody should get the same delta L. If, if you get delta L as positive tension, everybody should get the same thing. That, that won't change. Because when you, when you change your node numbers, what happens is L also changes sign. This also changes sign. So they will neutralize each other. Once you find delta L, P equals A over L times delta L. Now comes the reaction. The, in this, you cannot find, in this method, you cannot find the reactions because you don't have this matrix. You don't, you don't have this, you don't assemble this matrix. You have only this one. So you cannot find reactions. Any, any suggestion how to find reactions? I have found the element forces. Suppose I, suppose, um, I want to find reaction at node two. Node, there's a member here. Node 2 is attached to the ceiling or the wall. So this is, uh, uh, no, uh, this is node 2, this is node 4. I, I don't know what, uh, this is element number 2. Okay. So what we do is, in this method, we go to the old-fashioned method, old-fashioned method. I look at E2, element 2, I can find P2. I already have found that P2 is a e over L of element 2 times delta L2. Because each element in general will have different A e over L. Don't think all the elements have the, the class example, we make it same. But in practice, this A e over L, axial stiffness of the element will be different for different uh, elements. So A e over 2 times delta L2 is P2. Once I calculate P2, basically P2 is acting this way. If it is tension, it is like this. Compression, it is like that. So the reaction uh, is basically the same force. So this is the reaction. So if I, so what we do is that in this method, if you don't assemble the structural stiffness matrix, if you assemble the global stiffness matrix directly, you don't have information on the reaction. So what we do is we go back to the nodal equilibrium. So at, at a joint, so I can do it here itself. So to find the reaction, to find reaction, this is what you do. It is explained in the book also. So suppose you want to find the reaction at, at this node. There may be several, in this example, there is only one element. But in, in general, there may be several elements connected to this joint. It could be, okay? So you calculate the force P1, let's say, P2, 
P3. These are the forces acting on the element. If it is tension, they, they, they go like this. If it is compression, they go towards that. Then there is a two reactions, Fx, I, F, Y, I. Let's say let's call this node I. So I need to find the reaction. It's a simple static problem. Some direction equal to zero. Some of the forces in the y direction equal to zero. Some of the forces in the z direction equal to zero. You can put Fx, J also. Fz, I. So there are three reactions at this node and there are three static equation to solve. So you can find the reaction at this node if once you know the forces acting on the element attached to that node. And I know them uh, from this formula, P equals AU over delta L, and I should be able to do it. And these things can be nicely programmed, you know. Um, in the uh, So th this is one method of doing it, you know. The olden days, the memory is at a premium. It's very difficult to um, find memory because it's cost. Um, everybody is limited. So you want to use your memory as much as possible to increase the number of degrees of freedom. So you don't want to waste your memory in assembling a humongous matrix and then deleting the row. Because once you assign, the memory is taken. You, you can't get it back. And uh, so we, we follow this method. In the, I talked to Dr. Kim. He thinks the modern program, they assemble the whole matrix and then they, <coughs> they there is a method, um, you have to know Lagrange multiplier method, but they do modify the, modify the structural stiffness matrix. That's what I, I was talking to him, because I don't know how the abacus works inside, but that's what he thinks that in the modern programs, they don't care about memory because it's plenty available, so they, they use that method. So, but in the class, you know, it's very difficult for you to do a very big problem, uh, assemble it. It's, you can do it, but it's your kind of, it's a big matrix. <coughs> now, I, I kind of debated to myself whether I should teach thermal stresses or not. Thermal stresses or not. I think I have to teach it. There is no way you should graduate without knowing thermal stresses because it's such an important topic. I have, I have seen PhDs, 10 year, 20 year PhDs working in companies and labs and they, they don't understand, don't, don't tell anybody. They don't understand thermal stresses. They don't know how to calculate thermal stresses. So it's, it's a very simple subject. They miss it. They, they, they get the key concept. Once you miss the key concept, you, you can't understand. And um, of course, when you go to work, you know, there will be always short courses. Always the short courses are in Hawaii or uh, Baja, Mexico, somewhere. The company will pay for you. You can go take a class in thermal stresses. So, but I, I'll make it very simple. You really enjoy it. This is a three bar truss. So it's fixed and it's on roller. So I'm going to ask a simple question. So I, who wants to, somebody has to come to the board. I think the closest is uh, uh, Doug Lee. Okay, come on over. So the question to you is uh, Doug, I am, well, I'm not applying any force, I'm just raising the temperature of this member by delta T. Uh -huh. And it has a length L and a coefficient of thermal expansion alpha. Can you tell me what will happen to the truss quickly? Expand, yeah, show me. Expand, yeah, show me the expansion. You want a different color? I, I can give you. Yeah. Hope it writes. So show the expansion. So you, so duck is going to show you are heating this. What happens? Expand it. That is hinged. That cannot move. Okay. That point has to move somewhere. Yeah. Show the new member. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, you just expand it like that. Yeah. Man, how can you? It's attached to this. Anyway, Philip, he's confident. Look at his confidence. So th this has to expand. Imagine, suppose I give a new truss, three members. This is slightly longer, but these are the same length. Okay, this doesn't want to change the length. Okay, so it is just there. This doesn't want to change the length initially. That means it has to go in an arc. As long as this member goes in an arc, it's not going to change the length. So and this want to change the length means it, it is going to go as you duck said, it's going to go. But what will happen is it will go here. Okay. So basically it will go like that. You see that? So this will go up, elongate. This member will accommodate it because it can, it can, it can rotate. Okay? And then th this just stays there. So do you see that? So this is how it expands. Now what are the stresses in the members? Duck. What are the stresses in the, each member? This has a tension, is there a tension or a compression? No, nothing happening to this, okay? So it is not under tension or compression. Is this under tension or compression? No, it just rotated it, okay? How about this member, the one I heated up? It is under tension or compression, stress-wise. No, because it wanted to expand, it expanded. There is, there is no, nothing happens. So everybody is peaceful, no stress at all. So if, if you allow your roommate or spouse or partner to do whatever they want, there is no stress. You do, they do the thing, and you do the, your stuff, you can live happily. Now imagine, okay, let's take another, another truss. It's a four-bar truss. Now that we have done, who wants to do it? Now we have given some idea. Suppose I'm heating this, only this member by delta T. Quickly, okay, who wants to do this? What will happen? Same thing, nothing, nothing different. So all this, this triangle will remain quiet. Nobody wants to change the length. Now this will go in an arc, okay, this member, and then this won't expand. So it will go somewhere here, and then that's it. Nothing happens. So everybody is quiet. Uh, this, this member expands, whatever it wants. This will rotate and accommodate it. These three members, they say, we don't bother, don't bother us. They just stay there. Now comes the, I'm going to add one more problem for you to think during the weekend. Suppose I find this member is a, accept, this truss is an acceptable truss, meaning it's a, it's, a, it's a stable truss, nothing wrong with this truss. But I find this is very flimsy, this is very flimsy, I want to strengthen it. Okay, so what I do is I add a redundant member, this is called a redundant, you don't need it, now I add it. Now I do the same problem. I increase this delta T. Now comes the problem. Because this triangle cannot change shape. Because once you give three lengths, a triangle is fixed. Nobody can change. This triangle doesn't want to change its shape. Not, nobody wants to change the length. This wants to expand. If it wants to expand, it has to, somebody has to give in. Otherwise, so what will happen is, when it wants to expand, it pushes this. These two guys say, no, we don't, we, we don't want to change our shape. So it, there are a lot of complications happen. They, they transfer stress to this member, stress to this member. Then it, it in turn causes stress and all the members are stressed out. The neighbors, apartment in the top, apartment in the bottom. Everybody is stressed out because somebody wanted to do something that is not allowed. Okay? So, Look at this problem. Now everybody will have some stress, tension and compression, etc. There's just see, see. Now this happens in life every time because when a, when a, when a, when a space mirror or a, a satellite is flying, part of the structure will be under shade, part of it will be exposed to sun. It's hot. It's just, so some members want to expand, some members want to 
uh, now don't want to expand or contract due to so there is a lot of thermal stress happens so how do we solve this thermal in addition you can have external forces in addition I can have apply some forces to this truss in addition that's, that's not a big deal we can add them that's okay so the question is same thing happen in a solid suppose you have a shaft it is in a bearing the bearing heats up the coefficient of thermal expansion of the shaft material and the bearing is different each one want to expand by a different amount so they cannot accommodate so they create stress and um, sometimes we intentionally shrink fit do you have a shrink fit how do they put a shaft and a bearing tight so they they heat it up or cool it and then insert so thermal stress happens all the time in the engine heads cylinder heads in structures and it's I will make it so easy you'll enjoy it on Monday we will we will solve the thermal stress problem very smoothly and very simply so that you never forget in your life okay. the homework is due today and another homework is due next week sometime and there's a quiz coming up on Wednesday